Climate change is here. We are seeing and feeling it almost every day. And the first thing most of us notice is what it's doing to our water. Dry places are becoming drier, with droughts driving crop failure, livestock death, and displacement of people. Wet places are becoming wetter, with flooding destroying communities and contaminating water supplies. Because of what we've done, both through causing climate change as well as acting like water is free, we can't count on water being where we need it, when we need it anymore. We're now on the brink of a massive humanitarian crisis. Today, four billion people face water insecurity, which means that they just don't have enough water at least one day a year. Another billion people don't have safe, clean drinking water at all. That's our present reality. And by 2030, the United Nations projects that another 700 million people will be displaced by water insecurity. You heard that right. In just seven more years, almost five billion people will be facing water insecurity. That's pretty much all of us. And yet most of the time, there's plenty of water. The problem is we don't conserve and protect it so that it's there when we need it most. I've been working with water for about 20 years in places where it can be very expensive and difficult to make sure that people have clean water. My early career was as an aerospace engineer at NASA, where I designed water recycling systems for astronauts in space. This is a picture of me on what NASA calls the weightless wonder. I don't work there anymore, so I can call it by its real name, the vomit comet. <laughs> this is how we test technologies before we actually send them up into space. Astronauts on the space station need the same things we need, air, food, shelter, and of course, clean water. But water is really heavy, and it's incompressible. You can't really pack it down into a scuba tank and launch it up into space. It costs about $20,000 per liter of water we send up to the space station. So instead, we recycle it. Every day, we take the respiration, the perspiration, and of course, the urination, of every astronaut on the space station and recycle it back into clean drinking water. So that delicious cup of coffee you're enjoying today was also your buddy's delicious cup of coffee yesterday. <laughs> this is cheaper than sending up water, but add up all the engineering, it still costs probably a few thousand dollars per cup of coffee the astronauts have every day. Back here on Earth, we also value water. We need it for our snow and rivers, our animals, our food, and our cities. But we act like it's free until it's not there anymore. Here in Boulder and throughout the American West, we're entering the third decade of what is known as a mega drought, the first in 1,500 years. The Colorado River is the lifeblood for over 40 million people, and it's in danger of running dry. Meanwhile, in East Africa, another 40 million people are facing food insecurity and even the risk of famine because of what is now the sixth consecutive season of drought. In still other places in the world, there can be too much water and it can be dirty. Diarrhea associated with dirty drinking water still kills about half a million children under the age of five every year. I've just returned from Rwanda, a country I've been working in for about 20 years with an incredibly talented group of Rwandese and international professionals on these challenges, the intersection of climate change and water. Rwanda is one of those places where there's lots of water, sometimes too much, and it's dirty. Diarrhea is still the leading cause of illness and death for school-aged children in Rwanda. If we unpack that a little bit more, this chart is showing you wealth, GDP per capita, and health, in particular, the death rate from diarrhea among children under five. And I've highlighted the four countries in Africa I work in, including Congo, Rwanda, Ethiopia, and Kenya, compared to the United States. You can see that the poorer you are, the sicker you are. This might not surprise you, but there's another relationship here for us to study, and that's our use of energy. I'm sure you've all seen this picture before. This, of course, is the Earth as seen from space at night. And what jumps out at you are the lights, the electricity, the energy we use. You might think this picture is showing you where people live. It's really showing you where rich people live. There are still three billion people on the planet who use firewood every day to cook and stay warm. Here's where they live. And these are the same people in the same places 
facing the earliest, most negative effects of climate change, especially on their water. So let's dive into that energy question a little bit more. Here's who's using energy today and contributing emissions and causing climate change. This is per capita CO2 emissions. You can see the United States jumps out at us in dark red. The United States is the single greatest historic emitter of all time. While China produces more emissions annually now, not per person, per capita, we all are using a lot more energy and contributing a lot more to climate change than almost anybody else on the planet. So here's who's using energy and is contributing to climate change. And here's who's still sick from diarrhea and unsafe water. It's basically the inverse map. Okay, so what can we do about all of this? The big idea my team and I have developed over the past few years is to take the fast-growing world of climate finance, things like carbon credits, and steer that economy towards saving and protecting our water. A carbon credit is a financial commodity. It represents a ton of carbon dioxide either not emitted or removed from the atmosphere. Today it's worth about $20, and there's a multi-billion dollar market for carbon credits. The buyers tend to be corporations who are telling their shareholders, employees, and customers that they're going to be net zero emissions. They get there by changing their own practices and then buying the difference in carbon credits from projects that reduce emissions around the world. This works because the atmosphere mixes. It really is legitimate to reduce emissions in one place to offset emissions in another. Now, there are lots of questions about monitoring and equity that come up, but the basic science works. This has not been true for water. Water's a local problem. Save water in Colorado, and it does nothing for Rwanda. But if we instead can get carbon credits for saving our water, we can bring water into a global liquid economy. Okay, so I'll show you how we put that into action. In 2007, I started a company that was the first in the world to earn carbon credits for drinking water treatment. We were focused on communities in Rwanda and Kenya where people either boil their water to make it safe or they just drink untreated water because they can't even afford the firewood. When we install water treatment systems that clean up that water, and we monitor those systems using everything from surveys to sensors, auditors, even experimental studies, we can calculate how much wood is saved, both directly, wood that's saved from not boiling it, as well as the demand for wood that isn't even being met because of poverty barriers. We can translate those calculations into carbon credits, sell them on the market, and reinvest in delivering clean water. Today, our programs have reached over 5 million people in Rwanda and Kenya, and we've mobilized public and private sector investment of over $70 million from venture capital, buyers of carbon credits, governments, even NASA and USAID to invest in these programs while generating over $100 million in revenue. We're reaching people in places where governments and donors currently can't reach. Instead, investors take a big risk, millions of people get clean water, and carbon credits are generated. Our carbon credits are based on both the use of firewood and the demand for firewood. In this way, they're really about climate reparations. We caused climate change. People around the world are now feeling its effects. Now that trillions of dollars are finally being unlocked to take climate action, we should make sure that it gets to the people that are the most impacted. Of course, our water is dirty here too. Climate change, wildfires, use of fertilizers, urbanization is all making water quality worse in the United States. And normally, we have to build more and more infrastructure like this. This is a wastewater treatment plant. It uses a lot of concrete and steel, electricity, and it produces a lot of emissions. This is called gray infrastructure. And right now, we have to build more and more of this. But this isn't the only way. We can also go back to nature. We can protect our water using green infrastructure. We can reduce soil erosion, reduce our use of fertilizers, reduce the impact of wildfires, and clean up our water in the watersheds. When we do this, we don't need as much gray infrastructure anymore. We can reduce emissions, generate carbon credits that can actually pay for these nature-based solutions. There are multitudes and contradictions in this work, of course. Capitalism caused climate change. 
Can capitalism really be used to solve it? I'm not sure it's the best answer, but it might be one of the only answers we have left. Climate change is here. Protecting our water is a key to surviving the changing climate. Thank you.